Hello everyone, this is Tana with John Deyard's Life Spa. We are really excited for the call tonight because we're so excited for the Colorado Cleanse. We're getting really geared up around here to support everyone through what tends to be a very transformational event. So tonight, Dr. John will be talking about how you can benefit from the Colorado Cleanse and answering your questions. You know, any concerns you have, any questions about the Colorado Cleanse. And I'm just going to start off by giving you a few notes about how to interact on this call. So if you want to submit any questions online, you just want to go to lifespa.com forward slash teleseminars. And this is the page where you can view the call live. And there you'll be able to submit questions in a gray box and just type them there. And only Dr. John and Life Spa staff will see your name and email. It won't be public. And uh, you can also just watch the webinar live here. And this is also the page where you'll see the recording of the call afterwards. And again, that's just lifespa.com forward slash teleseminars. And uh, just if you're watching this on the YouTube page, please don't type any questions there since no one's monitoring that. And we won't see your question. So just go to the lifespa.com forward slash teleseminars. And if you want to ask questions verbally of Dr. John and have that opportunity, you can just call in and listen on your phone. And that number is 425 440-5100 and the pin number is 124-337-POUND. That's 425-440-5100 and the pin number is 124-337-POUND. And there will be um, periodically opportunities to like quote unquote raise your hand and we'll be able to see that on your screen and Dr. John will call you by the city that your phone is registered under and the name that your phone is registered under. So just take note, it may not be your name or the city you're currently under. And let's see what else. The recording will be available tomorrow. And if you're registered for the call, we'll also send you an email with the link to watch the recording. But again, it'll be at the lifespa.com teleseminars. And the next one is Wednesday, May 7th. It's on longevity, exercise, less is more. So uh, here is Dr. John. All right, hi everybody. Welcome to our call on the Colorado Cleanse. And um, let me get here. All right, let me go. And today I wanted to um, I wanted to just answer a lot of questions about the Colorado Cleanse. And um, I think that's the best way to go. Once I start talking, sometimes I get sort of I don't have enough time for questions, and that's really tonight's purpose is to go into some questions. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I've got one question here from Thornton, Colorado. How often are cleanses recommended, different kinds, or should we stick to one type? This is my first cleanse. Any tips on what to expect? How can I prolong the effects of the cleanse in my diet afterwards? What foods are best to eat? That's a lot of questions, a lot of good questions. Um, Generally speaking, the reason why this cleanse is so different is because it resets digestive strength. Most of us don't realize it, but um, our digestive system is our ability to detoxify. If we don't detoxify well or digest well, we don't detoxify well. So it's very important for us to be able to be good digesters. So we start the whole cleanse with four days of eating really simple foods adding beets and apples and greens to flush your bile, to eat, take these digestive herbs to boost your digestive strength. Then we continue those herbs while we go into the main part of the cleanse, part two, phase two, where we take ghee or clarified butter to again continue bile flow and to continue chelating, start, starting the process of chelating some impurities out of your body. And then we end with three days of going back to the same original diet uh, that you th started with, um, boosting some of the digestive strength herbs. When you go back to after having the ghee 
and a sort of a no-fat diet for those seven days. And then you go to a diet that is eating lots of different foods, rice, beans, vegetables, soup, salad, lots of things, just not a lot of junk food, not a lot of packaged foods. You finish the cleanse feeling quite satisfied. I did cleanses my whole life, fasted my whole life, and I gotta tell you, I would usually finish any of those cleanses like an animal, binging on every possible thing I could find. And what we hear time and time again from folks from this cleanse, they feel like, I don't wanna go back to eating regular food. I feel so satisfied with the food that I'm eating that I don't really need, that I don't have that desire to go back and eat all that junk food. They're feeling quite comfortable on the, um, on the, uh, the, the diet that we finish the cleanse with, which is really, really great, the phase three diet. So, um, so that's, uh, and one of the ways to help maintain the benefits is to continue on that mode of not eating a lot of packaged foods and a lot of junk foods. And here are the, the kind of the couple of golden rules when you finish the cleanse, how to maintain the benefits. We've really screwed up with our ability to eat the right kind of fuel. Ancient humans had fats as their major source of fuel, and we don't get enough good fats. We get, uh, they had about the same amount of carbohydrates as we eat, but their carbohydrates were 2% sugar, so ours is 30% sugar. We are not genetically wired to get fuel, 30% of our fuel from sugar. We have, the sweetest fruit was as sweet as a carrot in ancient times. So we have no genetic ability to handle this much sugar, this much simple carbohydrate. We are wired to digest fats. I was just finishing with a patient from Lebanon, and she was telling me, because we always talk about eating the brains of woolly mammoth, and that's what something that we traditionally did, and we gorged on all the liver and the organs. It sounds so gross now. And she was saying, when I was a young girl in Lebanon, we ate brains with garlic and lemon juice on a regular basis, and liver on a regular basis, and all the organ meats on a regular basis. These are things that were part of our diet. We have lost our ability to eat good quality fats and we have genetic ability to do that but if we eat good fats with lots of carbohydrates we overshoot our energy budget runway which means we have too much fuel. So we have to help the body not have excess fuel that will instantly store as fat. So we, if we're going to increase the amount of good fats we got to decrease the amount of bad fats. That means get sugar off the menu. And then if you're going to do that Ancient humans did move their body a lot. They had a lot of uh, um, physical activity, 10 to 15 kilometers of movement activity per day. So those are the golden rules. Increase good fats, get rid of bad fats, and those are all the cooked oils, cook, cooked uh, sunflower, canola oils. Look at your best, most famous organic whole wheat bread and look at the label. You'll see cooked oils in them. Whole Foods organic crackers have cooked oils in them. Everything in a package generally has cooked oils in them and they gotta go. So increase good fats, decrease bad fats, decrease bad carbs or sugar, and increase exercise. And that is the golden rule to keep yourself healthy when you finish the color cleanse. If you also, if you wanna continue to eat less of the hard to digest foods like dairy and wheat and, and corn and soy and those things, that can be a little easier on your digestive system as you, as you ramp up. When we finish this class, we're in spring going into summer, you gotta increase your diet, your dose of really good, easy to digest fresh fruits and vegetables. The summertime is when the digestive system is the weakest. The winter time is when the digestive system is the strongest. The heat of the winter helps increase digestive fire to cook the nuts and the seeds that are harvested in the winter. The foods in the summer, in the late spring and summer, are, har are, are cooked on the vine. They're cooked by nature, by the sun. You eat those foods off the vine, they're already pre-cooked for you. You don't have to take foods that, to increase our digestive fire that make us hotter in an already hot season. So the idea is that the digestive system is weaker in the summer, so therefore it's very important for us to um, think about eating more fresh foods. And of course they're all on the grocery list that you get, eating more fresh seasonal fruits during and vegetables during the summer months. Problem is most are eating burgers and fried food and you know barbecues and things that aren't cooked on the vine last I checked and very, very difficult for us to digest. So those are some strategies to keep it going. Let me see, this was a great list of questions. Um, 
I the one question about different types of cleansing. The, one of the major things about this cleanse, which is so unique and different, is that <clears throat> most cleanses just go in there and take the fat and pull it out of your body and detoxify you. It's fat-soluble toxins that are causing most of the problem, and they store in your fat. But the reason the body put it in your fat is because it didn't know what to do with it. The intestinal tract got congested, toxins defaulted back to your liver, your liver gets congested, and the liver goes, oh my God, I gotta get rid of this stuff. It puts it into your blood, and we store these toxins as fat in your deep tissues. And that's where they go. Now we go, well, let's cleanse those deep tissues and pull it out. The liver put those there for a reason. And that's part of the digestive process. If you don't reset digestive strength, you're just going to pull the stuff out of your fat and probably move the toxins from one fat cell to another because your liver is going like, I put that there for a reason because I don't have the ability, the time, the capacity to digest that right now. So therefore, I'm going to just put it in storage. And if we go unstore it, now we have a problem. And that's why a lot of people, when they do cleanse, they have what are called cleansing casualties or healing crises where they feel yucky as a result of cleansing. So that's why this cleanse is so beautiful and the Ayurvedic principles make so much sense is because it was logical. Of course you reset digestion. So when I think of the Colorado cleanse twice a year, it's what I do. I wouldn't miss it because the digestive reset shovels out a lot of the old toxins, but not until my digestive system is on board. And that's what the, the, the ghee is all about, you know, supporting you know, bioflow and digestive strength and the herbs to turn the digestive fire on, flush your intestinal tract, support the lymph around your gut. It's a pretty comprehensive program, which we'll, we'll, I'm sure we're going to talk about. So I think I did a pretty good job on that question. Uh, that was awesome. I got another question here um, from New York. I'm wondering about the exact food for this cleanse <clears throat> if one has a sugar handling issue. And how does, how does better, um, and how does better with protein than carbs since the kitchery is more carb based? I think what she's saying here is how, um, since the kitchery is mostly carb based, um, how is that good if you have sugar issues? First thing you gotta know, mung beans are loaded with resistant starch. Resistant starch is a starch that your body doesn't convert into sugar. There's study after study after study that says that mung beans will lower your blood sugar. We see in our cleanse all the time, people blood sugar, when they do the kitchery, their blood sugar lowers for lots of reasons. Um, <clears throat> resistant starch is starch that doesn't get broken down as sugar for you. It goes into your large intestine and feeds your bugs. Feeds, which is really interesting, it actually feeds the bugs that make ghee in your intestinal tract. There's one bug called Clostridium butyricum, which is the one bug, actually there's many bugs now they know, that actually make butyric acid in your intestinal tract. Butter got its name from a fatty acid called butyric acid. Ghee is concentrated butter fat, which is basically concentrated butyric acid. Absolutely, ghee is the most concentrated source of butyric acid on the planet as a food, and your intestinal tract literally makes its own butyric acid, its own ghee, and because it's the number one source of, of um, fuel for your colon cells and for the intestinal cells. It's the number one driver for your immune system in your intestinal tract where 80% of your immune system lives and it actually feeds multiple bugs in your intestinal tract. The resistant starch in the mung beans goes right through your intestinal tract, right to your intestinal tract and feeds those bugs that make the ghee. I mean, I just think that's just fascinating that in Ayurveda they knew thousands of years ago that our intestinal tract literally made its own ghee. And the way to feed that with more ghee was just sort of brilliant in a way. And it's designed, that ghee and that kitchery, in addition to flushing bile and getting the bile to burn fat and produce more bile, and you gotta remember, your bile, when you take the ghee, the bile is pac-manning a lot of toxic chemicals in your liver as well as in your intestinal tract, cleaning all the villi along the way, detoxifying your intestinal tract, supporting the opportunity for the good bugs to proliferate. Your, your body, your bugs, which are what, the 90% of you, they feed on fat and fiber, okay? Ancient humans, modern humans, they had the same amount of protein, same amount of carbs as we do more sugar now than they did, but carbs and proteins are the same. What is different is they had way more protein, way more fat, and way more fiber than we do. 
Fiber feeds your bugs, fats feed your bugs, your 90% bug. We gotta make sure we support the diversity of your microbes in your intestinal tract because they do the heavy lifting for every single function in your body, every single function. Your immune system, your mood. I just read a study the other day about, and there was a blog coming out about it, about how certain bugs have support anxiety. They actually support, uh, actually <clears throat> support the function of like Valium and uh, certain uh, um, <clears throat> GABA receptors, which support uh, anxiety and depression. There's bugs that do that for us. So the world is being, the medical world of how we understand it is being turned upside down. We're realizing that our whole thing is about microbes. And when you look at how Ayurveda put so much attention on digestion, it was really all about supporting an environment that could produce <clears throat> microbiology, that could produce neurotransmitters and immune agents. And the Kitri does that. So think about Kitri as resistant starch now, as opposed to this sugar blasting starch. The white rice, I get it, it's long grain, but when you mix it with the, with the beans and the spices, they become, they become very specifically able to lower blood sugar. And that's generally what we see with the Kitri diet. The times that we lose benefit there is if you're on the Kitri diet and you shouldn't be. We have three dietary plans. We have the transform plan, which is just Kitri only. You gotta have good blood sugar base to handle that. Then you have the um, rejuvenate plan, which is, which is kitchen with vegetables and oatmeal. And then there's the, the, um, the um, nourishing plan, which is kitchen vegetables, soup, salad, fruit. The only golden rule during those seven days in the main cleanse phase two is no fat. That's the only golden rule. And so if you're doing kitchen only and your blood sugar is crashing, you're going to have blood sugar issues. So you have to be and we write about this in the book, we'll talk about it in the emails, the one thing that can undermine our success with this cleanse is having unstable blood sugar and being more aggressive than you should be. People thinking, I have to strain, I have to be an endurance event to make this work. It's not true. The more you strain, the more your body thinks you're crazy, the more the body's gonna store fat, and the less successful the cleanse will be. The more comfortable you are in this cleanse, the better the results. Please hear me loud and clear. The more comfortable you are, the less you strain, the better results. Better to do the, the nourishing plan with soup, salad, fruit, and vegetables, even a little bit of lean meat or a protein powder to keep your blood sugar stable is so important. And then if you're feeling really good with the, the nourishing plan, then go to the rejuvenate and then go to transform. Work your way into the austere only kitchery diet plan particularly when you're doing this for seven days. It's a long haul after four days of preparation for it. It's a two week event. So you wanna make sure that you are nourished along the way. That was a great question. Um, second half of that question, um, if someone has candida or yeast, same idea, thank you, yes. Candida and yeast are fed by, by sugars, certain types of sugars. And again, the other thing about the, the, uh, the kitchery, when you're eating this way, your metabolism slows down. You are taking a lot of ghee first thing in the morning, which increases bioflow, which is a Pac-Man for the candida and gets to knock the candida down. In addition, you're not eating, you're eating three meals a day, but you're not eating a lot of food. So your, your calorie intake is actually, you know, significantly less. So you're working on less calories. So what you're actually ingesting, you're using as fuel for your body, for your brain, for your mind. So you're using that as fuel. There isn't a lot of excess to go around for you to, uh, for, for you to, uh, um, you know, store as fat or feed the candida or create a lot of problems. Kitchri, for so many reasons, was baby food in India. It was the first food a baby ate. It heals the intestinal wall, it repairs the intestinal wall, it feeds the good microbes. It's, it, it, you know, in, in India, we know that the, intest the baby of an intestinal tract is completely sterile when it comes out of the mom. It has to create all these good bugs. Well, what perfect food then to feed it with, with a good amount of fiber and a good amount of resistant starch to actually, which is what Kitchri is, to actually begin to feed the good bugs, which we now know based on really cool science that that's exactly what these things do, is they feed the good bugs in your gut. Um, great question, thank you. Uh, here's a question from Northport. Um, when drinking sips of warm water every 15 minutes, how to fit this in around meals? I'm concerned about the water 
diluting the digestive juices? Okay, great question. In Ayurveda, we know, and it's probably true in a lot of different systems of medicine, that you don't want to drink a lot of water with your meal. You want to have this consistency of the food sort of like a soup in your intestinal tract. That's the goal. If you drink a lot of water right with the meal, it becomes too soupy and you dilute your digestive fire. Sipping warm water throughout the meal is perfectly fine. Having a big, large glass of water um, 15, 20 minutes, a half an hour before the meal has significant benefits for doing a couple of things. And I actually just found a study last week about the benefits of drinking a big glass of water a half hour before the meal show that people lose more weight, their digestive strength is stronger. I've got a blog coming about that. I thought that was really cool. Again, proving that modern science is really proving these ancient principles again and again. I think that's really what we do on our newsletters is try to find those that research and bring it to you. And I just think it's so fascinating. The stomach lining has a buffer layer underneath it, which is 80% water. If you take water in a half hour, 20 minutes, 15 minutes before the meal, it prehydrates that buffer layer. Buffer layer goes, whoa, I've got all this buffer here. I can buffer as much acid as you need to cook all that food. If you don't have water and you're dehydrated, then what happens is the stomach doesn't have that buffer and the stomach goes, if I cook a lot, burn up, make a lot of acid here, I'm going to burn a hole through this and stomach lining and cause some problems so I can only increase my fire 20, 30, 40%. And if you increase your fire only 20, 30, 40%, you can't digest wheat. It's got hard to digest anti-nutrients on it. You can't digest dairy. It's a, casein is a hard to digest protein. You can't digest soy. So those guys now, because this is only one reason why the digestive fire gets turned off, but that will allow those foods to go undigested, impact your intestinal mucosa, rip your guts to shreds, cause inflammation, bloating, and we blame it on the wheat and the dairy. I don't think that's fair. I think we've been, those have been found guilty without a fair trial. And we need to realize that some of those problems, not all, some of those problems are caused by the inability to digest well. And part of that is to prehydrate the stomach lining so the stomach has a fighting chance to make bile and stomach acid in the first place, which I think is a great, great strategy. Okay, uh, another uh, really, oh, so anyway, sipping throughout the day um, and then sipping with meals is perfectly fine. The big glass with your digestive herbs is 15 to 20 minutes prior to the meal. Okay, good. Let's see what else I got. Um, some more questions. Let me go here. Um, let me see who's on the phone. And if you guys have any questions on the phone, I'd love to hear your voice. Just press star two on the phone and um, I'll get to you just in a second. Let me see what else we have here. Uh, any other questions we have here? So again, just push star two to, uh, well, here they are. So here's one from Quebec. Would you address the question of eating disorders on cleanse? I wonder if cleansing would not increase the obsession with food and diet and lead to more distress after or during the cleanse. I, a, a great question that I sort of touched on earlier. In phase three of the cleanse, when you finish the, the main part of the cleanse, where you're doing the ghee in the morning and kitchery or a, a no fat you know, meal throughout those seven days, in the end of the cleanse, you're eating really wholesome foods. You know, you're eating, you know, um, vegetables and soup and salad and, and you're, you're eating quite good. So most people really do feel like when they finish the cleanse, they are not craving and feeling the need to binge on that. And that's really one of my favorite parts of this cleanse is I don't have that craving binge response, which I think is a real critical piece of the puzzle. One of the major reasons we have eating disorders is because, of course, stress that pounds away at our gut. The gut stress impacts the microbiology. We know for a fact the microbiology makes the neurotransmitters and makes our mood calm and able to handle, handle stress. We know that the bugs eat fat. We know that we don't digest fats very well. We know that we have become lousy fat burners as a culture. That's why we eat little meals all day long. So we're feeding ourselves with sugar, which goes up and down, and up and down, up and down, carbs, which we know is the bad fuel. We are not getting a lot of good fats, which are the fuel that, the fuel that we actually need to eat. So we are 
we are basically genetically not equipped to digest the kinds of fuel that we're eating in the majority. Majority of the fuel we get is carbohydrate. We don't have the genetic, genetic skills to do it. So that's part of it. So we are in this cleanse in a big major way, resetting your ability to be a good fat burner. That's what we're doing. And by having you have, you know, kind of, kind of easing you into it for the in the first four days, and people feel that their cravings go away, they start feeling better. When you start taking the ghee first thing in the morning, you're going to feel absolutely in the first day or two. People also they lose more cravings, they lose their appetite, they're not hungry. You're in fat metabolism. We're resetting fat metabolism. That's why this is so good for our mood, for our energy, for our vitality, for our intestinal tract. We're burning fat as a fuel. Your bugs eat the fat. Our brain eats the fat. Our body needs to burn the fat for stable energy, long-lasting energy to sleep through the night. Fat is the stable, non-emergency, long-lasting endurance fuel. We don't burn that fuel. We've lost that ability, or no, we've lost that fuel supply, and we need to flip it. So we're starting to reset that with, you know, with ghee, which just turns out to be the one fat that our own intestinal loves so much, it makes its own. I think that's just phenomenal. So I think you're on the right track. If you have eating disorders, we've had such great success with people getting more stable by getting them to be good fat burners. Uh, in North Wales, Pennsylvania, I've been eating gluten-free for over a year and have decided after some experimentation that I'm not yet ready to add it back to my diet. And in addition, I recently found that my energy is generally getting better. And if I limit my intake of rice, if I am in, if I limit my intake of rice, is this cleanse program, which emphasizes rice and mung beans, appropriate for me? Sure, it is. You don't have to eat rice for this cleanse. You don't, only golden rule in this cleanse during the main cleanse, and is no fat. That's the only golden rule. Um, I would venture to say that the reason that you're not digesting gluten very well is because of, like I just mentioned, your digestive strength has gone south on you a little bit. And that would be what, and that's what we're after is to reset digestive strength. So that would be very, very helpful. But you can do the whole cleanse without doing rice. You can do the whole cleanse without doing mung beans. But you generally, it might be a little harder because you're gonna want, you wanna get some protein. But even if you just ate lean chicken, I mean, if you really want to do it, you could do lean chicken every day uh, with a little bit of some other type of a grain or vegetables or something. You could even do the paleo diet on this cleanse. It would still work because the only golden rule is no fat and, and really, really very low fat as you can get because we reset that fat burning with the ghee that you take first thing in the morning. So yes, you can totally do it. Um, I do suggest that um, you experiment with with uh, the mung beans and maybe quinoa. We're, we're actually experimenting with some recipes like kitchen recipes with quinoa and it tastes really good. You can do that. So that's another option for folks. Um, so you can, you, can, you can experiment with things, but rice by no means is it a requirement. Um, as your digestion gets better, as you become a better fat burner, as your digestive strength amps up, you're going to find that you can begin to tolerate wheat again, that you can begin to tolerate rice again, and you're not so digestively sensitive. Remember, the reason, the other main reason why we stink at digesting hard to digest foods like wheat and dairy is because our liver doesn't produce enough bile. And the reason the liver doesn't produce enough bile is because the intestinal tract is congested and toxins will default back to your liver. Your liver goes, are you kidding me? I just dumped those toxins into the intestinal tract to be processed and they're back. And that's when the liver goes, I'm just gonna put it into the fat and get rid of it and see, deal with it later. And that, um, over time, congests your liver's ability to produce bile. Bile in your liver is a Pac-Man for the yucky stuff. And when it goes into your intestinal tract, it Pac-Mans the yucky stuff. If you don't have enough bile, you don't have enough buffer for the acid. Same with the water around your stomach is a buffer for the acid. The bile is a buffer for the acid when it leaves your stomach and goes into your small intestine. No bile, no buffer, no acid. No acid, no wheat, and no dairy. Every single food you eat is gonna impact you way harsher than it should because you didn't break it down properly. And bugs and parasites and weird stuff like that 
are going to be not are not going to be broken down in your stomach because your stomach said, "Hey, there's no bile down there." And if there's no bile down there, I'm going to turn the fire down. Because if I keep this fire up and there's no buffers for that acid, I'm going to burn a hole through his intestinal tract and that could probably kill him. So we can't have that. So I'm going to take the lesser of two evils. I'm going to turn the fire down. And that'll create less acid to match the fact that, that they have less bile. And if we can bring those guys back up, now we're back in business. You know, meat's back on the menu, you know. It's, it's the ability to digest hard to digest foods. And not that I'm pr promoting wheat at all, um, but some people definitely need it. And it's because they don't have the ability to digest the, the simple foods and deliver that as fuel. So we crave the denser foods. We crave the denser proteins. We crave the denser breads. If I don't eat bread or pizza or pasta, I don't feel satisfied. That's because we have weak digestive strength and boggy congestion in our, in our villi of our intestinal tract. This is how, why the cleanse is so cool, because it scrubs the villi. It gets on the outside of your intestinal tract, you have all the lymph which all the, where all the congestion is, and we clean all that lymph, get the villi to work, and now we decongest your liver and your bile. The bile can make, the liver can make bile, and the bile can neutralize the acid. So it goes, let's turn the fire back on. That's what we're trying to do here. So then, then when you're done with the cleanse, you're leaving that with a much better reset, a much better ability to digest and naturally detoxify on your own. And you can say, well, I just won't eat wheat and dairy forever. I, don't, I feel so good without wheat, I never want to eat it again. I get that. And I don't care if you ever eat it again. You don't have to at all, or dairy. Now, I'm not trying to make you eat wheat or dairy or anything. But there's mercury from the coal mine plumes that cover all of America that, and Canada that are on every organic piece of spinach and every organic vegetable that are hard to digest fat soluble um, molecules that if you don't have the ability to, to, to digest wheat and dairy or you get really sick or nauseous with greasy fried food, you do not have the digestive strength to digest hard to digest toxins like the mercury on your spinach. And that is what I'm concerned about. I don't care if you eat wheat and dairy again, that's not required. But being a good detoxifier is required to live a long, healthy life. Because we have this mercury, it goes into your fat, it can spill over into your brain, it can affect your cognitive function down the road. And those are real issues that may not be on your plate or on your radar today, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, they will be on your radar. Your cognitive function will be on your radar. Your joint elasticity and youthfulness will be on your radar. And that, I really believe, takes place years prior. That's why we're so passionate about the Carla Cleanse, because it really, in my mind, isn't just a shovel it out, feel better for two week plan. It's a reset for the long haul. And, and I, I, I truly believe that. And I, we see that with our clients, and that's why I think this cleanse is so awesome. Um, so I have more questions. That was a great question. You guys are, um, let me go to the, to the phones here. He was on the phone. Um, star two, if you guys have any questions. And, okay, I have tons of written ones here. Um, from Berkeley, I'm not looking into losing any weight, but rather work on my digest system and the cleanse. Is this cleanse for me? Yeah, absolutely. Because you, we have three dietary plans, the, the transform, the regenerate, and the rejuvenate and the nourishing plan. You definitely eat off the nourishing plan. You don't have when you you know. And also, you can take the herbs just once a day, but take them for a longer period of time, and that'll kind of dial down some of the cleansing intensity a little bit. But you still can you know, support the digestive reset in a real big way, um, and that's what you can do. And and um, also during the cleanse, you can. Um, you can uh, have a little more protein powder, or even a little bit, a little bit of protein powder, or a little bit of lean meat. Is sometimes you know nice to have to support the the calorie intake that you need to not lose any extra weight. It's a very very common thing, and if you do it right, you can definitely gain um, the benefits. Um, from Saint Michael's, you've indicated in your literature that it's important to prepare the liver in advance of the cleanse. What do you do to prepare the liver in advance? of commencing the cleanse. First of all, we start with four days, the, the phase one of the cleanse. We start by having you have 
a lot of fresh, whole vegetables, no processed foods. Your liver can't stand cooked oils. Your liver can't stand processed foods. It doesn't know what to do with all the oils on the grocery store shelves that are in those plastic clear containers. Your liver doesn't even know what to do with that. It just layers congestion into your liver. Number two, we have a beet every day. We have apples after the meals, and we have green smoothie. Those are all designed for your liver, to prepare your liver so it gets happy and says, yeah, I'm open for business. I can start pulling some of the yuck out of the stored fat cells. That's important, uh, those things. Plus, we give you herbs. We give you turmeric, which is a fantastic bile mover and liver anti-inflammatory agent. We give you an herb called liver repair, which repairs and supports the function of your liver. We give you an herb called beet cleanse, which cleans out the bile ducts of your liver really well. And then the warm digest to helpfully turn on the digest, or the cool digest to turn on the digestive fire. Also, you, we give you an herb called uh, mangista, which is a great herb for your liver. I primarily kind of coin it as our lymphatic herb, but it's also fantastic for your liver as well. But it's a big lymphatic mover, that's how I look at it. And then, of course, there's the regenerate herb, which is for blood sugar and stability. And it's a chelator. It pulls toxins. It's a detoxifier. So that's all in the first four days that does that. And then the next seven days are when you take the ghee. The ghee is a big time liver flush because it forces your bile to flush. And that's one of the reasons what we're trying to do is get that bile to move. Going back for a second to the uh, hunter gatherers um, is that we, we know now from Western science that 94% of the bile that goes from your liver to your intestinal tract, from your intestinal tract back to your liver, 94% of that bile goes back to your liver. Now remember, the bile is a Pac-Man, pac manning toxic chemicals, cholesterols, heavy metals, loaded with a bunch of backpacks, dumped into your small intestine, where it continues to Pac-Man a whole bunch of yucky stuff. 94% of that bile goes back to your liver and, and deposits all that toxic stuff into your bloodstream, into your arteries, into your fat, into your brain. That's unacceptable. If you don't have enough fiber in your diet, 94%, and that's a, a textbook fact from Guyton's physiology textbook. That's what a regular American person does with 20% fiber in their diet. Hunter gatherers got 100 grams of fiber in their diet, five times as much as us. That fiber attaches to the bile and takes it to the toilet. Now, if you don't have enough fiber in your diet, 94% of that bile is back in your liver. Your liver is going, oh, you got to be kidding me. Why are you here? You, I just got rid of you and now it's back. That's what happens. Now, if you don't have enough fat in your diet, which we don't as a culture, all the bad fats have screwed that up, and sugars have screwed that up, the body will use that bile back to, from the liver to the intestines, back to the liver, to the intestines, back to the liver, to the intestines, 17 times before it gets discarded. Because we, and that was because we didn't have woolly mammoth soup every night for dinner we had, it was feast or famine. So we had to use that bile up to 17 times to survive. But unfortunately, now we're doing that on a regular basis, washing our dishes in the same dirty dishwasher up to 17 days in a row. That's unacceptable. So that's, um, that's a really important, I'm gonna go back to I'm trying to see why I'm, I'm answering this question. Oh, it was all about the liver. Um, What's, what, why are we, how are we preparing the liver? Um, and because, so when you do the bile, when you do the ghee in the morning, you're forcing that bile to flow, feeding the liver with the fuel that it needs to make bile with. And we don't make enough bile, bottom line. That's why people can get their gallbladders taken out. I had a patient today, had her gallbladder taken out. Absolutely no difference in her diet. She didn't feel any different. Not one iota of a difference did she feel. Didn't feel better, didn't feel worse. It felt exactly the same as before. That's a problem because, because our gallbladder should be a requirement. If we ate the kind of fats we were designed and genetically wired to eat, we don't. And, and so with the, with the ghee, it's forcing that bile to flow. It's feeding your gut with good microbe food that we know is fact now. We know it also, it actually is a lipophilic. The ghee pulls toxins, and we have studies to back it up from the punch of karma research that we did. Um, I didn't do it, but it's been done. But you can read about it on my site. Um, so just all kinds of things for the liver. It's so much about the liver and the lymph and the quality of your intestinal villi 
and of course, turning on your digestion. And we haven't even mentioned blood sugar yet, uh, which is another big piece of the puzzle. Uh, from Mystic, uh, if that's Mystic, Connecticut, that's a pretty awesome place. I love Mystic, Connecticut. Um, I have had issues with small bacterial overgrowth and was interested in the cleanse. Would it be appropriate to have tried to completely eliminate grains as suggested? But many nutritionists say, uh, uh, that suggested by many nutritionists, and uh, it hasn't really worked for me. You know, for many years, when I first got into practice in 1984, um, we were all about killing candida, killing parasites, we killed everything. That was like in. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, these bugs are really, they, 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 they multiply some of these bugs a million times in eight hours. So, I mean, if you kill them, they're just gonna figure out what you tried to kill them with and come back with something stronger, better, better armor. They become resistant. And we just, we just, it's not the way to go. We need to support the body's ability to take care of business by helping the body be a better digester, having better digestive acid, better biofilm, which is your Pac-Man to get rid of those little bugs. And yeah, take the hard to digest foods out of your diet for a while, like the like the wheat and the dairy, and yeah, for sure, they're hard to digest. We take those out during the phase one of our cleanse and phase three of our, through the whole cleanse we take those out because they're hard to digest. But that's not the final answer. The final answer is to be a better digester therefore a better detoxifier. So I would suggest that, that for you, absolutely. Now, if there are any foods like rice is like, ah, taboo, and it makes you feel yucky, then like I said, you don't have to use rice in this cleanse. You can get around that with quinoa and other strategies, absolutely. But as you become a better digester, you're gonna find, and we find that people, one time they could only do the nourishing diet plan, then they do the rejuvenate diet plan, and then they can do the, the, the kitchery only or the transform plan. They work their way to being really good digesters, and that's really key with regard to blood sugar. And that's one of the biggest factors. Our blood sugar is unstable. We need sugar because our brain's hooked on it. And that sugar not only makes our brain happy, but it makes our bugs, the bad bugs, proliferate. And the good bugs feed on fat and fiber. The bad bugs love sugar. Wouldn't you know it, right? I think in heaven, though, I heard that there's uh, lots of sugar there and it's free and it's all good there. So we have to wait. I don't know. But because um, it's sort of a bummer that we have this thing called sugar, which is so tasty, but it's actually killing us. It is the number one poison on our planet. The number one cause of every chronic disease on our planet is linked back to blood sugar. It's really sad, but it's really true. Um, Morgan Hill, how, do, uh, how important it is to use the cool or warm digest? The cool digest is for people who have tendency for a heartburn. The warm digest people have just regular digestion. It's very important to use those herbs, or we give alternatives in the book if you want to use other strategies for that. But you want to, you don't want to do this cleanse and miss the boat of turning the digestive fire on. That's like the whole thing. And we do it with the water before the meal. We do it by increasing bile flow, and then the stomach goes, oh, there's bile there. I can make more acid now that there's a buffer in place. That's great. But we want to boost the digestive fire with the warm digest, boost the, uh, the, um, um, bile flow with the beet cleanse, decongest the bile duct. There's another herb called sugar destroyer, which cleans out the, the pancreatic duct, which is another buffer for the acid, another really important for our digestive enzyme flow. So all those three up work together, the warm digest or cool digest, beet cleanse, sugar destroyer, support the upper triad of digestive function, digestive fire for the proteins and for the bad bugs to get rid of them, and the toxins, the beet cleanse for the bile flow and the liver function, and the sugar destroyer for blood sugar support, pancreatic function, and digestive enzymes. You get those three guys working in concert, good things are gonna happen down below, really good things. Then after the meal, we give you the turmeric, the liver repair, the mangista, and the rejuvenate. All those after the meal act as a sweep to support the whole digestive process. Um, so it's a pretty, in pretty good plan and um, so yeah the warm digest and the digestive support is important because the whole point of this is to reset digestive function and at the end the, in the phase three we boost the, the dose of the beet cleanse and the warm digest to get the digestive turned on as well okay um, I am in the beginning stages of menopause and experience severe headaches in the afternoon that get worse at night 
as the night goes on and also wake up with night sweats at 5 a.m. What can I do during the cleanse to remedy these symptoms? Um, great question. What I have found is that the number one cause of hot flashes or night sweats is one of two things. One, liver congestion. Two, lymph congestion. The third is actually a hormonal imbalance, not the first two. Your reproductive system drains into your uh, lymphatic system, which surrounds your intestinal tract. If that lymph system is congested because of poor digestion, you don't eat wheat and dairy, those, they irritate your gut wall. They create inflammation. The lymph on the outside of the gut wall gets congested. Your drains are clogged. Your lymph system, your immune system is stuck in traffic. You hold on to more water. You gain weight. You swell. The body can't get rid of its own waste. It doesn't feel good. It's toxic. So that's lymphatic congestion. When you menstruate, prior to menstruation, the body is detoxifying through internally through the lymphatic channels. I wrote an article on this called It Might Not Be Hormonal for Women with Reproductive Hormonal Issues. And the reality is, is that when you decongest the lymph with an herb as simple as mangista, I've seen so many people, women, get so many clinical benefits just by getting the lymph to move with one simple herb because it drains the lymph. So now prior to menstruation, the lymph is draining the reproductive fluid and they feel better. If that lingers and that lymph congestion lingers, those toxins will default back to your liver and your liver will get congested. Now your liver, when it gets congested, doesn't produce adequate bile. The liver, when it gets congested, now your, your, your reproductive system is defaulting those toxins that should be going through your lymphatic system back to your liver. And your liver doesn't like that. And it becomes toxic and overheated and congested. We call it liver heat in Ayurveda but it's definitely the congestion of the liver's ability to produce certain detoxifying enzymes like glutathione peroxidase and the superoxide, superoxide dismutase. These are powerful liver cleansing uh, free radical scavenging agents that when the liver gets congested, they become sort of non-functional for us. And the liver gets congested and we get a hot flash. So we do the ghee and we flush the ghee. I would say try to amp up the doses of ghee if you can, because that'll make you feel better faster. Don't skip out on the beets when I say eat one beet a day, maybe even think about two if you can tolerate it. I would suggest that you make sure you do your green smoothie and your apples are all about liver and bioflow. That's what they're all about. So um, I love how everything sort of connects, how we really understand the body Ayurvedically. It's sort of dot connecting, you know, it's really beautiful. And thank you for all these questions because it's, uh, it's just really cool. Um, I have a broken foot and was wondering if I could do the cleanse while my foot is trying to heal. I am currently uh, taking uh, vitamin D3, K2, fish oil, bio fish oils, probiotics, ubiquinol, trace minerals, calcium, magnesium to help with the healing process. I'm thinking I would have to stop taking these supplements during the cleanse. Um, um, you do not have to stop. What we can do is a couple of things. If you want to continue the healing with some of those oils, you can take the um, the only thing I would suggest to do is stop the fish oils and the vitamin D3 during the, the pre the phase one and phase three, the seven days before. But during the main cleanse, when you do your ghee, if you take your fish oils and your vitamin D3 with the ghee, that's when you can do the fats. And those fats would be very valuable then, in fact. And that's a, an okay time to take those, okay? Um, the rest of the time, you know, taking a four-day break from those when you're doing a whole food diet, trust me, if you, you're going to be fine with those. The probiotics, if you want to continue to take those, that's not a deal breaker. Trace minerals and calcium, magnesium, for sure you can take those. So I don't have any problem with you doing it. If you modify it a little bit, that would be the only time I would be a little concerned. Um, is this a calorie-restricted program? No, it's not. Although, when you burn fat, you don't need calories as much because you're burning a different kind of fuel. So, um, so, so you don't need that many calories. So the idea is when you do the ghee and your body goes into fat burning, you're naturally going to not be hungry. If you're not naturally not hungry, then eat. 
three good meals a day. We don't say make this portion as big or portion as big or small, just eat. Um, kitchery or kitchery, vegetables, fruits, salad soup, just make sure you follow some of the golden rules. We have kind of some no, we have like foods not to eat in phase one and phase three. And we have foods not to eat in phase two. And the only one in phase two is fat. That's the only golden rule. And in phase one and three, it's all the allergic foods, wheat, dairy, fish, uh, corn, soy, um, shrimp, and I forget, something else like that, but simple things, things that you would have no problem um, staying away from. And that's it. So it's not a calorie-restricted diet at all. In fact, if you starve and you feel starving, we undermine the success. So it's so important that you feel satisfied either from the food or just naturally satisfied because you flipped into a fat metabolic state. That's critically important. Uh, great, awesome question. Um, can you talk more about a about a bite about a bite? Uh, please um, about a digestive form. Oh, a bit uh, about a digestive formula. I'm losing my eyesight here. Uh, um, about a digestive formula, warm and cool digest. Okay, I did a little bit about warm and cool digest. I think I'll skip on. Those are just the digestive formers for your stomach. If you don't have great digestive strength in your stomach, you won't motivate bile flow. You have to have acid in your stomach to motivate bile flow. No bile, no buffer for the acid, therefore no acid. No bile, no Pac-Man and yucky stuff. No bile, no poop. Your bile regulates the consistency and the regularity of your stool. It's a lot of stuff. And I'm probably leaving out a bunch. Um, so, but so, but that all comes from turning the digestive fire on. So, in the same way we turn bile flow on to turn the acid on, we turn the acid on to turn the bile flow on. They feed off of each other. Um, kind of important. What do you think about drinking raw milk after the cleanse? I think raw milk is fine. You know, I, I if you can get raw milk, I think and make sure you know that it's really from a good, reliable source where it's where it's clean. Ayurveda always says to boil the milk anyway, which is a good way to kind of cover your, your bases there. Uh, I think it's fine. Um, again, milk is not a requirement, uh, uh, but some dairy products can be you know, very, very valuable. I'm a big fan of cheese, raw cheese you can get now in the States after it's been for, you know, processed for at least three months. They have lots of good bugs. Good raw milk has lots of good bugs. Yogurt has lots of good bugs. So you have to start thinking of ways after the cleanse to get your ferments back into your diet. Very important. I'm also a fan of taking good probiotics after the, after the Colorado cleanse as well. And probiotics are sort of an interesting thing. There's many different strains of probiotics and many of them are what are called transient. They go through you and they don't stick and adhere to the gut wall. And probiotics um, that adhere to the gut wall are called colonizing. And there's not a lot of them. And in fact, I have, there's about four strains that we write about on my website. And you can go and look and read what those strains are and read the research that shows that they actually stick to the gut wall and poop out waste that other good bugs eat. So we have two products that actually support that, which I think are great after the cleanse or even prior to the cleanse. One is called the Gut Revival, which has yeast and immune builders that I use for indicate candida and things like that where we're going to populate really good bugs but take out some of the bad bugs and you do that for a month and then you follow that with the floor restore those a day while you're adding ferments to your diet and after the cleanse taking either the gut revival for a month and then the floor restore or just the floor restore if you're healthy and then the ferments or even just the ferments if you're healthy depending on where you feel with regard to your microbial diversity, which is a little tricky to know, but you know if you have good digestion or not. But always ending the cleanse by repopulating the bugs. You have a reset digestive system now. You scrubbed a lot of bad, bad bacteria. You've detoxified. This is a fantastic time to repopulate with good bugs. So the three things that I recommend are one month of the gut revival, one month or so of the floor restore, and then adding ferments to that. That's my favorite plan. That's what I do to really help to continue to create diversity. It's important that you create starter bugs in your gut with bugs that adhere to the gut wall, and then you start eating foods that are a little less sterile. Um, 
you know, fermented foods. Don't wash your vegetables so much. Organic foods have five times the bugs that conventional foods do. That's one of the major reasons to eat organic, not just because of the lack of pres preservative or pesticides. Um, we use whole herbs. All the herbs you're getting in this cleanse are organic. They're loaded, you probably don't want to know this, but they're loaded with bugs good microbes. Every microbe attaches to very specific plants and those plants provide diversity to our microbiology. That's how it works. No good bugs, no good diversity. If you take extracted herbs, for example, they just basically kill all the bugs. And they work great from a perspective of, you know, medicine, medicines, but they're not restoring microbiology and they are so critically important. So just, you know, understand, you know, another level of why we are always wanting to eat, eat healthy and then go from there. All right. So um, I don't have a gallbladder. So what can I do? Well, I recommend the caudal cleanse people with alcohol bladders all the time. When you don't have a gallbladder, like the lady today who had a, who's a patient of mine, she didn't have a gallbladder. And when she got the gallbladder taken out, she said it made no difference. She felt as yucky after as she did before. It made no difference. I said, well, the problem clearly, obviously, wasn't in your gallbladder. It was in your liver. The liver was congested. And the liver wasn't producing adequate bile. So now, you're probably still not producing adequate bile. We haven't fixed a thing. Nothing changed that we got rid of the, the gallbladder, unfortunately. So when you don't have a gallbladder, you want to encourage your, gallbladder, your liver's ability to make bile on demand. That's how it works. Now, and, and if you don't have a gallbladder, I need to let you guys know, this is not the end of the world. The, the, the gallbladder is loaded with bile that's 15 times concentrated bile. 15 times concentrated. It's for woolly mammoth brains and woolly mammoth livers. It's for eating all that in one huge sitting. And then we don't eat another fat for days while the bile is being replenished. We don't have to eat that way. We can eat good fats along the way. I don't think it's a requirement to pig out on a woolly mammoth brain to support your, your liver function. So if you don't have a bile, a gallbladder, you're obviously not gonna be able to handle huge amounts of fats in one, in one sitting. But you have to nudge it a little bit every day to continue to make it flow. And once in a while, like with the cleanse, we nudge it a little bit harder. We're taking, we amp up the doses of the ghee. I always say start with just one teaspoon, see how you do. Go up to teaspoons, see how you do. Generally, I say with people without a gallbladder, stay at two teaspoons of, of ghee throughout the cleanse. But if you're feeling really good and it doesn't, and you're having no issues at all, then for sure, see if you can take it up a little bit longer, a little bit more, because that ghee will force more bile on demand, decongest the bile, and give you some of the, the fats that your liver needs to help replenish some of the bile stores. Um, uh, a great question. Thanks. I'm glad that came up. In Nyack, given that we are people of various size, weights, ethnicities, uh, how is it the two-week cleanse detoxifies the same way, at the same pace for each of us? My digestive system is significantly more sensitive than that of a lot of other people. Your two-week cholera cleanse is a one-size-fits-all. Not really. When you read the cholera cleanse, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We have all kinds of ways to turn up or turn down the volume of the cleanse, for sure. There's, we talk about, in the, right in the beginning of the book, it talks about if you have a sensitive system, you lower the dose of the herbs, you lower the dose of the ghee. We have three dietary plans, the, 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 the kitchery only, the, 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 uh, the rejuvenate plan, the nourishing plan. Many ways to, to, to dial up and tailor make the cleanse for you. So it, by no means is this a one size fits all cleanse. It definitely has ways for us to to dial it up. Now we do sort of support all the systems in the body. We support the lymph flow on the outside of the gut wall, the health of the intestinal villi. We support liver flow, pancreatic enzyme flow, bile flow, and digestive fire. And we chelate toxins out of the fat cells and the brain. That's one size fits all. But how we get that done is we, we make so many mentions throughout the book to remind people to dial in and dial up their individuality. So great question. Thanks for that. But by no means is this a, a one size fits all cleanse. Um, will I be able to work on my regular job 
Absolutely. This cleanse, we all here at LifeSpot, we all work during every Colorado cleanse. I go and give lectures. I travel. I, uh, like, like last year, I was in, I don't know where I was, but I wasn't here lecturing while I was on the cleanse. And it just sort of makes you have to think it through a little bit. And, and you know, you're on the road traveling and lecturing. But I lecture, which takes a lot of energy, and I do it on the cleanse. And so it's designed to be done as part of your work day, as part of your regular routine. We do have the retreat track, which is where you can actually, you know, just really uh, um, go on the cleanse and do the yoga and the breathing and the meditation and the retreat and the Ayurvedic massage. And we have that available to you. So if you have that time, but by no means is that for everyone. This cleanse is designed for people during their work program, for sure. Absolutely. Another great question. Namaste. Are you familiar with the GAPS diet? Um, a little bit uh, about healing and sealing the gut. And if so, do you think the color cleanse would be a good transition from the regular GAPS diet? I absolutely do. I mean, you know, the whole point of understanding the microbiology and then the GAPS diet being a support system for that is really all about um, healing and sealing your intestinal tract. Like we talked about with the ghee and the kitchri and the no fat diet and I mean it's and all the herbs we're using to repair and seal and the microbi the, the probiotics afterwards, as we mentioned, I think it's extremely valuable because what we're trying to do is reset function so you can not be dependent on pills or powders, not be dependent on different types of diet, and have some latitude in terms of your digestive strength doesn't mean you go back and eat a bunch of sugar. I mean, I think sugar, unfortunately, is just something that we really have to limit or even avoid. And uh, and there's been toxic oils and cooked oils. I think you have to limit or avoid them even at, at, at greater cost. I think it's really important that those two guys are understood and on your radar and not in your diet. Those are the things that are taking Americans out. Fats, cooked fats, bad fats, processed oils, and sugar. Those are the bad guys. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's see, another question. Someone with a recent bout of hyperthyroid Graves' disease, non-treated, uh, treated only through diet and herbs, feeling much better now, but flushes the heat and insomnia, but only flushes of heat and insomnia now. How might this cleanse affect me? Well, <clears throat> I should tell you a, a quick story if I have time. Do I have time? Do we have time? Um, are we out of time? Is we've been an hour? Okay, so I'm going to tell you this quick story and wrap it up. It's a great story, though. And we'll end on this note. So I had a woman who she came for Panchakarma. And uh, this is an important, a really great point to end on, I think. <clears throat> and she um, had Graves' disease, hyperthyroid. Goiter was out to here. Her neck was about the size of a grapefruit. And uh, we talked with a medical doctor, and we worked with him to get her. And she wanted to do Panchakarma, our detox, which sort of is like home Colorado cleanse in a way. Um, very similar. We kind of designed the I designed the Colorado cleanse to be sort of a home punch of karma, if you if you will. And um, one of the cleanses that we do during the punch of karma is a, a nasal inhalation therapy. We clean out a sinus in the brain called the sagittal sinus. And in Ayurveda, this is the sinus that the brain uh, stores a lot of old emotional toxins and chemicals and things like that. And um, so as a result, we clean that part of our brain out. Now you also have to know that Ayurveda is all about getting the body to be less dense physically. So we have more mental awareness of underlying mental, emotional patterns of behavior that aren't supporting us any longer. So, and we, when people come for Punch of Karma, they do uh, Ayurvedic psychology exercises that I give them. I work with them every day to guide them through the kind of an emotional unraveling journey, journey where they can free themselves from old repetitive patterns of behavior that may have been there since childhood that weren't serving them. So she did this detox with for her brain, kind of a, a uh, kind of an oleation or like ghee. It's a, it's a ghee-based product to clean the toxins out of her brain. And she was doing some of the homework assignments I gave her that the next that afternoon. And she said she had this epiphany where she was 14 years old, and she she completely had blocked this out of her mind where she was abused. And she said it was really weird because I wasn't affected by the abuse event itself. I was really struck by the fact that that prior to this abuse, I had this perfectly happy-go-lucky childhood. I was just so happy. Then after that, I became this type A, 90-hour week, corporate executive, straight-A student, perfectionist that drove myself into exhaustion, color-coded closet, and pushed and pushed, and pushed myself as a way of surviving and run away, running away from this event. And she said it was so weird because I was looking at that event and the difference before and the difference after. 
and she said she had burned out her adrenals, she burned out her blood sugar, and now she is burning out her thyroid. All the organs that we muster up extra energy to fight stress. And, um, and um, so um, she looked at that and she said, that was like 10 minutes, it was bad, but it was 25 years ago. I don't need to hold on to that anymore. And she dropped it. And by the end of the Panchakarma week, her thyroid was normal size, true story. By the end of four months or so, her thyroid levels, her numbers were over 2,000, the highest thyroid numbers I've ever seen. Really dangerous high, came down to normal levels. She lost 400 points just during the week of Panchakarma itself. And then soon, within four months, it normalized. She has since had a baby and having a normal life with no thyroid medication. I'm not saying that that's what we're claiming that we do is fix Graves' disease without. It, it, but what we do do is we expose awareness. You become more self-aware. And in the Cargo Cleanse, we have a lot of self-inquiry exercises built into this plan. We have a whole cleanse called the Short, the, uh, the Lighten Up Emotional Freedom Cleanse, which is all about videos that I made to guide people through the emotional process. But so much of this is about letting the truth of you out. Ayurveda, Ayur means life, Veda means truth. Ayurveda is a science of letting the truth of you out. And many of us let patterns of behavior, mental stressors, make us into something that we not. We let other people's stress make us miserable, as opposed to being the sun. The sun doesn't care if the flowers blossom. It doesn't stop shining light because you're killing its cattle. It can't do that. And we really can't either. And I really believe that's what Ayurveda is about. That's what this cleanse was really about, is to get people to be less dense physically, more aware emotionally and mentally, so we can see, why am I not having fun in my life? Why am I feeling miserable? And that stress implodes right through your gut, takes out your bugs and your neurotransmitters, your immune system, and the heavy lifting for all the function in your body. So we have the science now to prove that your emotions take out your bugs. And we have a, an ancient system that's been proven, and even good modern research, which I don't have time to go into, that proves that there are molecules of emotion. They're real. They're science done in, by, the, by Candace Pert at the National Institutes of Health. They're real, and they store in your fat, and we can pull them out and flush them out and free ourselves from these old patterns. And when they're gone, we don't keep driving down the same stressful roads, plowing stress through our gut, taking out our bugs, taking out our neurotransmitters, and taking out our optimal health. And that's the magic. And the cool thing about Ayurveda is they understood the whole plan, not just like fix your digestion plan or here's a diet for this or a pill for that. It's the whole understanding of how the whole thing works to better, to unleash our full potential. And if you don't want that, just being content in your skin is good enough. Not carrying as anger and resentment and trauma with you every day of your life. That can go. And that's really why I love people cleansing for sure, be a better digester, be a better detoxifier, feel better in your skin, run marathons better, all that's there for sure. But more important is, you know, us being content at a much deeper level. I hope you guys enjoy the cleanse. Uh, we're available, we have tons of support here to guide you, and I'll, and I'll try to answer as many questions in our daily emails as possible. So please, if you have more, I didn't get to them. I apologize for not getting to your calls or your questions. And uh, hopefully we'll get those get to you get to those in the daily emails. All right, thanks very much.